this is the last session, uh, but it's a really important one, and we wouldn't be here had it not been for the failure of macroeconomics back in 2008 to spot the crash coming. Okay, um, but I'm going to turn straight over to David Vines. We have um, three pr three presentations, and I'll make some comments, and we'll try and throw it open to some questions. So, David, perhaps you'd like to start off. Very good. Could we ask for the right slides, please? Uh, terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, well, th this is a pleasure to be here, and it's an even bigger pleasure if I can get this to go forward. Perfect. Uh, I'm one of those people who stands convicted of believing during the Great Moderation that we really learned how to do macroeconomics well. We built a benchmark model which we teach to our graduate students, which solves beautifully and looks clean and coherent. And I somehow persuaded myself that the world was pretty close to what the model was. We all look pretty foolish when we were like that. Um, Olivia Blanchard famously said, the state of macroeconomics is good about three months before the world collapsed. Uh, <coughs> as a result of this uh, mismatch between what I believed and, and what was going on around me during the, great, the, the global financial crisis, I set about with a group of colleagues to uh, uh, have a project which will lead to a double issue of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy on rebuilding macroeconomic theory. And the project that we've set ourselves is, uh, imagine uh, asking to build an approach to macroeconomics that you can teach to final year undergraduates or first year graduate students with the kind of clarity that happened after the Keynesian revolution when people were teaching Keynesian economics and people believed they had something useful. It's clear that as we went through the GFC, what we were teaching in that first core course in, in macro to graduate students just didn't bear any relation to the kinds of questions we'd needed to think about. Uh, in this paper, I'm going to talk a, very quickly about having been through paradigm shifts before. I'm then, then going to describe this model that I felt so comfortable with until the world collapsed around me and my model. And then in the later parts of my talk, I'm going to talk about, in a rather conventional way, uh, about what to do next. And it's conventional in the sense that this is what you would want to teach people to understand macroeconomics. It's much less useful than the kind of work that John has been engaged in, which is re what you might call real policy modeling for people actually giving advice about policy. And what I'm going to say is, in a sense, much less fundamental than what David's going to say, which attacks, I think, in a very interesting way, the fundamental premises of the whole modelling framework that we, we use. Let's just describe the 30s, uh, because they give you an idea of what a paradigm shift really is. When uh, Keynes was confronted in the Macmillan Committee with Montague Norman, uh, in 1930, Montague Norman said, I can't understand what all the fuss is about. Industry should be able to adjust itself. Uh, and Keynes, in 1930, didn't have the equipment to describe why macroeconomic policy was necessary to do the stuff that adjustment of wages in an individual uncompetitive industry couldn't do. By 1936, he'd written the general theory with nominal wage rigidity. And what that provoked was a need to understand the consumption function, the multiplier, and liquidity preference in order to be absolutely sure why the interest rate wouldn't spectacularly well adjust to, prevent, uh, to an, ensure that the economy kept on working without unemployment problems. Um, but more than that, as Hicks and others showed, this analysis in the general theory introduced general equilibrium theory, that's to say that what happens in one market affects another, that when there's unemployment in the labour market, people get less income and buy less goods and that causes unemployment to get worse. And watch that going backwards and forwards between different markets. And I, I think of that 
as a real paradigm shift. Uh, that's to say, new content, the, including the multiplier, and new method doing general equilibrium theory. In the 70s and 80s, the problem was not mass unemployment, but what you might call mass inflation. And the results of that for economic thinking were very mixed and the, 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 the battles of that time still live on. People like me adopted an evolutionary approach. We had introduced the Phillips curve. We persuaded ourselves that it was vertical in the long run so that uh, that meant that uh, in the end, if you wanted higher employment in the economy, it needed to be supply-side policy. We, we, we thought of the need in the end to put a nominal anchor in the economy in the way that the ISLM system had never done, uh, which became after 15 years of battles, monetary targets, the exchange rate mechanism, in the end, inflation targeting. And we gradually understood how to connect this up with the analysis of economic growth which we'd all been doing. Uh, I think of this as evolutionary, uh, and uh, it, it was certainly a new way of thinking about policy, but it evolved out of what we'd done before, and it led directly to the new Keynesian model that I was so falsely comfortable with uh, in uh, what I described. But there were rock throwers in the American Midwest whose approach was much more revolutionary. They had two ambitions. First, coming from the Lucas critique, which, which argued that, that if people behaved in one way and you changed policies, of course people would behave, change their behavior. And to understand this, you really needed to do all the things written on that slide. That's to say, microfound your models, have optimizing agents, have them forward looking, and constrict all this analysis to consistency with rational expectations. And that, 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 that dogma as a way of thinking about uh, decision making, which I think David would rightly ridicule from the world he lives in, has been enormously uh, hegemonic in the subject ever since, and, and, and you'll see that, and it, it'll form part of this discussion in this panel. The second thing these Midwesterners wished to do was to show that Keynesian economics was a bunch of nonsense, that markets would clear themselves. We'd go back to the Marshallian economics that Maynard Keynes had escaped from in 1930. Uh, and that view, although there are still many who live uh, well east of Boston, well west of Boston, uh, but nevertheless their dominance has disappeared. Uh, so we're, but we're left with this insistence on consistent optimizing microfounded rationality as a way of doing macro, uh, even though we are uh, New Keynesian. Let me just describe to you what we are as New Keynesian. Uh, it's, it, it's an economy which uh, those of you who are economists will know has a consumption function which is for, forward-looking, called an Euler equation, a forward-looking investment function. It has forward-looking and consistent inflationary uh, processes, although, uh, the, the, although consistent and forward-looking, there is the kind of rigidity that means that policy is necessary. And Inflation can result when aggregate demand is different from aggregate supply, and you have a Taylor rule, and you have uh, a, a central bank following something like a Taylor rule to discipline this economy. And we know very well how to think about what that economy does. Uh, this shows uh, in a way which you might not be able to read enough to make much sense of, the effect of a permanent productivity shock in this economy. To the top left, up there, you have output falling. That causes investment to collapse down, top line. The, gradual, the capital stock gradually falls. The interest rate has to be cut to ensure that the demand for output, which has gone down because of investment falling, doesn't fall too much. And, and that fall in the interest rate will, will counteract the disincentive to invest caused by the loss of productivity, 
wages will gradually fall. But the crucial point to describe in that story is that you end up back in a straightforwardly sensible equilibrium that looks just like you were before, except that the economy is less productive. But the crucial point is how strong an attractor this in, in technical language this equilibrium is. Similarly, if you do an inflation shock with this model, inflation at the bottom right-hand corner goes up, so the central bank will raise the interest rate, output will be depressed, that will cause both consumption and investment to come down. Notice that the capital stock will first fall and then rise back up again in the top right-hand corner. This uh, uh, operation of the Monetary Policy Committee will have profound effects right around through the production system of this economy. But again, crucially, this economy at the end of these slides goes right back to where it was at the beginning. And that's uh, what I'd somehow persuaded myself during the Great Moderation, the economy was really like. Why is this uh, a world that made me increase... Uh, uh, I've lost the construction of that sentence. Let me start it again and just say, because I believed this, uh, I felt in feel increasingly foolish as I watched the, the great global financial crisis evolve around me. Look at what happens... Uh, to potent actual output in this economy, which uh, is the US, which was growing at that steady rate before 2007, and look at actual in the red line at the bottom. Now, the purpose of showing you those slides previously was to show you that when you disturb this economy that we thought we understood, you go right back to where you started. And that doesn't go right back to where it started. 15 years, no, we're 10 years later. Now, you could say, and there's been st stupid attempts to rescue this way of thinking by saying that the global financial crisis was a productivity shock, and that's why we're lower. And some of the discussion about the secular stagnation on the first night had that aspect, but there's much more interesting, important stuff to say, which Adair put, Turner put very clearly, this is a problem that demand 50, 10 years later is still below supply. Now, that's just not consistent with the model I simulated with those pictures a minute ago. And uh, why is the model stupid in being confronted by something like this? There's no risk premium in this model. And secondly, the powerfulness of rational expectations looking forward is what gives this the attractor property of going back to where it started. Everyone understands it's like bringing up your children. You teach your children to believe that the world's going to be all right. And, 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 and when they're confident and well brought up, they do things which are consistent with the world being all right, and it turns out to be all right, and that's self-fulfilling. That is not what's happened over the last 10 years. But secondly this experience of the last 10 years is not consistent with that very interesting paper uh, which was presented on the first day uh, about the effects of autonomous demand expansion on the economy. And I, I flick through these slides very fast, but the important point is from these, that, that lecture, these simply photographs of the slides of that lecture, you increase demand permanently in this economy, and 10 years later, the blue line is well above the red line that's zero. And you remember, in my model that I simulated, when you shock demand, it just goes back remorselessly to where it started. Look what happens to inflation. That's meant to rise in my model in order to make the central bank raise the interest rate and pull the economy back to where it went. That just doesn't happen. Look why it doesn't happen because when there's a stimulus to demand, people accumulate more capital, and that enables the economy to produce more to satisfy the extra demand. Look at that blue line, just keeps on rising, that stock of capital. And finally, people work harder. To, to, uh, employment, top right-hand corner, is higher. None of this is consistent with the model that I described to you. Furthermore, at this INET conference, We've had three other issues that uh, 
very important and not in the model. Inequality, which we all care about, but it matters in macro. This top 1% grabbing all the income, which has been so much a part of our discussions, uh, reduces the willingness to spend. Secondly, uh, Adair Turner talked about the declining cost of capital, and that reduces investment. And if consumption and investment are both low, that means that fiscal policy will be necessary when the economy is in a, in a depressed state. And none of this is consistent with the previous understanding. Now, can we do something that's helpful? There are a lot more things to say on these slides, but I want to focus in on a very concise, simple, uh, blunt answer to this question, uh, uh, provided my, my colleagues, uh, Wendy Callan and David Soskis, which gives you an answer that's consistent with reorganizing your thought in a way that's helpful. Supposing you take this model that I've been happily simulating for you, and you do five things to it. Supposing you say that there's a zero bound to interest rates, and uh, uh, what am I trying to do? I'm, I'm subjecting this imaginary model to a very big negative shock like in the global financial crisis in 2008. And I say, suppose interest rates reach their zero bound so you, can, you stop being able to control this economy with monetary policy. Suppose, for reasons which Paul Krugman and many others are puzzled by, inflation doesn't start deflating when there's lots of unemployment, second point. Suppose that there are what we can technically describe as strategic complementarity amongst investors, which are easy to understand in a climate of uncertainty that we know about. I won't invest because you won't invest because I won't invest. Uh, uh, fourthly, suppose that in such a world there's very little technical progress, an explanation of the very poor productivity that we're experiencing. Why? Because there's very low investment. And finally and crucially, suppose there is not this happy sunshine in the rational expectations way that leads us all to believe that one day everything will be all right again, like my young children, and get on with getting on with being all right again. Those five things are, are sufficient to turn that uh, model that I described to you and simulated into a model which can stagnate in the kind of long-run Keynesian unemployment equilibrium that that picture there tends to suggest we're living in. And, and it seems to me that a task of those who, of us who teach macroeconomics to undergraduates and to graduate students is to say, well, when the times are good, it looks like those lovely pictures. But when the times, there can be bad times when it looks like, like that not so lovely picture. And that leads me to my conclusion, which clicking back through many more suggestions of details, which I don't want to go through, to say, what do we learn from this exercise? I think that there is a valuable search underway by people like me who are teachers. That's to say, to find a simple, straightforward model, which can, when things are good, describe a world in which things are good, but which is also capable of clearly explaining to us the list of things which, taken together, can make the world continuously not good in the way that I've described. And having done this, that will uh, enable... Uh, or, or rec with that ambition, we will, we will do two things. First of all, we'll see off this hegemony of rational, optimising, forward-looking consistency as a requirement for everything that we think about. But secondly, and I wanted to end this way, we'll make room for the sort of stuff that John Muirbauer does. That's to say, we will make it no longer intellectually respectable, it, it, intellectually unrespectable to be not using these assumptions, 
and to be saying valuable things about policy. There's, like the 16th century after the Reformation, we have to recognise there's no longer a true church in macroeconomics. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Right, the future of macroeconomics, why central bank models failed and how to repair them. So I'm going to skip through some of the critiques and go straight to this one. Um, the new Keynesian dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, well, my view is that would have been nice um, because I don't think the theory was new. In fact, the theory was outdated, outdated by the asymmetric information revolution of Stiglitz and Akerlof, who have both been at the conference. It wasn't Keynesian because it ignored the coordination failures, um, some of which David just talked about, especially between the real economy and finance, which David didn't talk about. Um, it wasn't dynamic enough because in the real world, lags, real world lags are very different from the way these models describe. Um, they're much slower, actually. Hardly stochastic. Stochastic means to do with distributions. So we've got two kinds of distributions. We have cross-sectional distributions, heterogene heterogeneity. Agents differ in all kinds of ways. And we have time series distributions, probability distributions over time. Um, events happen with uncertain outcomes. So both of these, the true uncertainty um, in the real world was ignored, um, essentially, in, in these models. And hardly general equilibrium, uh, missing most of the system feedbacks, some of which I'll talk about. Now, we know from um, David Hendry's work um, that rational expectations and intertemporal, intertemporal optimization break down very seriously when there are structural breaks in the economy and radical uncertainty. And of course, the economy is subject to many structural breaks. Think of globalization, technology. Think of the uncertainty we face about uh, artificial intelligence and robots and so on. So let me give you a brief outline. I'll start with the representative agent model and why it's so wrong. Then talk about information, liquidity constraints, income uncertainty explain why the revolution in credit market architecture, which has been a big focus of this conference, actually, uh, the lunchtime, post-lunchtime session today, for example, and why debt matters. We had a wonderful session on debt um, yesterday. Then move on to consumption, because that's 60 or more percent of total GDP. It's really crucial to understanding how the economy operates, and um, it's the key weakness, actually, of the new Keynesian DSG model. And then talk about what we can learn by empirically modeling consumption together with the other things that households do, namely the portfolio decisions. Right, so the lack of a representative agent is, should be pretty obvious. In real business cycle models, <laughs> there's a model of a representative degree of unemployment. So every household has the same level of unemployment, which is ridiculous. We know unemployment risk varies hugely by occupation and education. We know that in the real world there are credit constraints, mortgage defaults, negative equity, um, vary hugely across households. How can we address this? Well, we can no longer work with a, represent a representative agent that represents the average of the economy. We have to think about stochastic aggregation working with means and other distributional parameters. And doing so, we can still make progress. Now, one very important insight from this very famous paper by Hautaker in 1956 is that what happens at the micro level need have no relationship in, in terms of functional forms with what happens at the macro level. So with his assumptions, you've got no substitution in the technology at the micro level, but a high degree of substitution at the macro level through the extensive margin. We've done work using these ideas on uh, UK mortgage defaults in which we can track negative equity using aggregate data, and it works really, really well. Okay, income uncertainty, liquidity constraints, and buffer stock saving. That's what was missing in the new Keynesian DSG model. 
Uh, Angus Deaton, who got the Nobel Prize, laid the micro foundations for this approach. Um, with liquidity constraints and serious uncertainty, many households uh, in, indulge in buffer stock saving, and they have shorter time horizons. Uh, and the more uncertainty they face, the shorter the time horizon. And uh, in his book, he summarizes the evidence um, against the, the simple permanent income model. Chris Carroll has done a lot of work in the same area. Now, in Angus Deaton's 92 book, um, the Clarendon Lectures at Oxford, he makes the point that we really need to integrate, we need to go beyond the simple buffer stock model and integrate the treatment of illiquid assets like pensions, stocks, bonds, and houses um, into the model of, of the household. Um, and very recently, 20 years on, but very belatedly, the profession has come around to thinking um, in actually implementing his, uh, his suggestions. So Kaplan, Violante, and the other papers here that I've mentioned uh, are doing a really good job in looking at the micro of what, what's going on there. So I mentioned that credit market architecture has gone through huge changes. In the, uh, in the web version of, of, this, of the paper, um, I talk about the US, which is really interesting, but just for the UK, we had absolutely radical changes compared to the 1970s. So we abandoned exchange controls in 79, the banks invaded the mortgage market, the building society responded, they were given new liberties. And a second wave of innovation happened through the centralized mortgage lenders that invaded the market. Then we had a mortgage crisis and a credit crunch. And then in the mid 90s, a new drive for liberalization uh, particularly in the buy to debt market, increased securitization, a new breed of centralized lenders who weren't working through the high street. And we, we've tracked uh, a measure of what happened there. Um, since 2008, of course, we had a very serious credit crunch and a partial relaxation after that. So taking these shifts in credit market architecture into account is really crucial to understand what's going on. Now, we all know why debt matters. Um, Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory, summarized here. Um, I mean, you understand this very well. And you'll know about Adair Turner's work and uh, um, Shulerick and Taylor and Mian and Sufi and so on. Um, in fact, back in 1990, um, Anthony Murphy and I wrote a paper about the unsustainable credit boom that had happened in the, in the late 80s, and we argued that it was going to have very negative consequences, which indeed it did. So when I said that the New Keynesian um, TSG model lacked general equilibrium, I mean, these are the kind of feedback loops that were completely missing in, in that model. So in the US, you know, the mortgage and housing crisis had feedbacks through lower demand for housing big impact on the construction sector, big impact on consumption, and then the negative feedback on the finance side. Um, bad loans fed into the ability of banks to uh, advance credit, uh, credit uh, spreads widened, and so on. So you can see that um, without serious public intervention, the um, Great Recession would have been far, far worse. So I'm particularly interested in understanding the consumption linkage in, in that story. So we need a more general consumption function and an income forecasting equation to capture the consumption channel in that financial accelerator. So a really important aspect of this is we want to take full account of the structure of balance sheets. So it's not enough just to look at net worth. Net worth is liquid assets, minus debt, plus illiquid financial assets, plus housing wealth. That's net worth. I think it's really important that we disaggregate the balance sheet of households when we try to understand what happens to the household sector. And moreover, that we take into account the shifts in credit constraints that have occurred over time. Now, my criticism of the new Keynesian DSG model applies to a degree to the non-DSG models of the Federal Reserve um, of, the, of the Bank of England, the old Bank of England model and the LBR model, and indeed the new 
ECB non-DSG models which are being developed. Because in those models, they impose a net worth constraint. So the only way in which asset prices and credit and so on debt enter consumption, the consumption function is through net worth. And that is incredibly restrictive. Now, a key aspect of this is to understand differences between countries as well as differences over time. So if you have a very restrictive, a conservative credit market, um, that suggests that aggregate consumption is going to fall when house prices rise. And that's because first, future first-time buyers um, have to save more for, for their deposit. And uh, if people don't have access to home equity uh, withdrawal, then they can't spend the increased collateral that they have. Whereas liberal mortgage markets like the UK's or the US imply the opposite. You have a low down payment constraint, uh, you don't have to say very much to enter the housing market, and the access to home equity means there's a big response uh, in the aggregate to an increase in housing collateral. So this is uh, a picture of what happened to the mortgage credit um, conditions index in the, in the UK. So you see the big liberalization in 19, uh, from 1980 onwards, um, um, the um, early 90s credit crunch and a much more serious credit crunch from the recent past. Now, we've um, implemented these ideas in a model of UK consumption that incorporates these shifts in credit and disaggregates the balance sheet. And one can tell very good stories about, about what happened both in terms of the long term and in terms of the, the recent crisis in the UK. So the, um, the red line is the consumption to income ratio. Uh, you can see big fluctuations in it. Um, the blue line is the, credit condition, is the contribution of the credit conditions index directly to explaining those variations. And the pink line is the interaction of housing wealth and credit conditions. So that says that when credit conditions uh, are loosened, the housing collateral effect is much more powerful than when credit conditions are tight. But given this liberalization and this increase in, in house prices, there's a big offset, which is the dotted declining line, which shows the contribution of um, liquid assets minus debt. So as people build up debt, so the burden of debt, the permanent burden of debt on consumption becomes more and more serious. That's the payback effect of liberalization. And so when in the crisis you have both a credit crunch and the collapse of house prices, um, you get a very sharp fall in the consumption to income ratio, but households can't deleverage fast enough. Uh, they're stuck with high levels of debt and therefore they have to cut consumption. Um, the model has other things in it. It's got uh, the stock market, it's got uh, income expectations, it's got interest rates, all of which uh, are quite important, but let me skip over that. So, um, some of the insights. Well, one learns a great deal about why it is that the consumption of income ratio has trended up over time, both in the US and the UK, and of course what happened during the build up to the crisis and during the crisis. <clears throat> Another really important insight is into these shifting correlations between, between debt and economic growth. Steve Keen talked about this the other day. Uh, he made the point that um, there's a positive relationship between credit growth and a negative relation um, to the level of, of debt um, with economic growth. And in my approach, you can reconcile this because when you have shifts in credit supply, um, that explains why it is at certain periods there's a positive correlation between debt and, and consumption. Um, but credit crunches obviously arise when, when that changes. Um, our models also take uncertainty quite seriously and we can proxy this pretty well with uh, the change in the unemployment rate. Moreover, in the UK, where we have a floating rate mortgage market, there's a big cash flow effect 
in the aggregate for changes in nominal interest rates. When nominal interest rates go up, the cash flows of people in debt um, fall. So we need, actually, not just a consumption equation, but we need to model the combination of um, consumption and, uh, and balance sheets. And uh, we need to do that by estimating a system in which we can extract this ambiguous thing that's really quite hard to observe directly, namely credit conditions. So we do that in a latent variable approach. And um, I've done some work with people at the Bundesbank and the Bank of France. And um, the results are really interesting. Now, I think I've used 15 minutes if I... You've had 15 minutes, but you can have a minute more. If you so, think. yeah. So, with this approach, one can tell some, some new economic stories. One is that money transmission in Germany, for example, is very different from the US or the UK. The role of demography is really interesting. Demography matters a great deal for the composition of portfolios, and then feeding into portfolio composition, it then feeds slowly into consumption. So one can work out long-term implications of the big shifts in demography that have taken place. Um, now, the part of the story is that the role of debt is very important. So the empirical relationships that say that high debt, other things being equal, uh, cause low consumption, um, cast some doubt on central bank policy, as has been discussed several times at the conference. You know, if you have a period of very low interest rate for a long time and encourage households to build up more and more debt, in the long run, that higher debt is going to constrain consumption in the future. And it's not a good long-run policy. So I'm not claiming, I'm talking about macro time series work here. I'm not claiming that micro evidence is unimportant. Micro evidence is really important. But macro shifts in credit conditions and asset prices have macro effects that can't be ignored. So finally, um, to return to the new Keynesian model, Defenders of the model claim that it's flexible and that we need that approach to tell economic stories built on micro foundations and to incorporate expectations. Well, I disagree. The Euler equation that David talked about is a straitjacket and it's strongly rejected by the data. It's one of the most rejected equations in macroeconomics. Um, the claim micro foundations are sand. There is no representative agent the information economics revolution implies heterogeneity and short horizons um, in the face of liquidity constraints and serious income uncertainty. And the key economic stories about finance and the relationship between finance and the real economy can't be told in the new Keynesian ESG model, but these new insights into household behavior do help. Let me stop there. Thank you. So I am, or at least my economics training ended in 1969 uh, at King's College, Cambridge, where I mostly learned about Keynes and didn't get to hear about new Keynesianism, after which I became a social scientist and a psychoanalyst. And I'm going to talk about something slightly different. So why I think we're concerned about macroeconomics is because we start from the problem that we didn't see the problems coming. And then as I understand it, we have quite a bit of difficulty understanding the way out of the problems at the moment, or indeed whether we really know where we're going. So it seems to me the future of, macro, of macroeconomics is to re-establish a credible reputation because its raison d'etre really is to support macroeconomic policy and to try and be reasonably convincing. And I think the kind of populist stuff and all that is quite important because actually we do need models that we at least believe in uh, and central bankers can believe in if we're going to avoid sort of very unproven ways of thinking about these things. So I think there are three ways in which macroeconomics might uh, re-establish a credible reputation. 
One is clearly by incorporating some secure advances made in other areas of economic thinking, such as information economics, game theory, etc. Secondly, I think there's a huge scope for new methods of analysis and data handling. If Doyne Farmer had been here, he would have talked about that, but from physics and computer science and so on. But what I want to do is raise a much more fundamental issue, which I think lies at the heart of economic thinking. And this is basically that human economic agents simply cannot know the economic facts of the world or coordinate on them, except through their human interpretive and perceptive capacities. And this, of course, is necessarily based on their brain architecture and psychology and located in specific social environments. So the point I'm trying to make here is you get a lot of talk in economics about things like fundamentals, about information and so on, but how does that get into a human head? And that's really what I'm trying to talk about and that social science and psychology are interested in the fact that, as you all know, really, if you try to uh, consider what do you think is going to happen to the economy in the next 10 years, you actually have to interpret data using the capacities you have. And in modern social and brain science, facts are simply not available for action, except via embodied and socially influenced perception and memory. And I'll talk a bit about that. But first... It means that the first thing that I think people have to do is actually study much more directly. I think what John just was talking about was a move in this direction. But study much more directly how do economic actors actually behave in different parts of the economy. So The Alchemy of Finance by George Soros was a kind of autobiographical account, which in my opinion gives a far more accurate idea of what goes on in finance than most, if not nearly all economics textbooks. Why Wages Don't Fall in Recession by Truman Bewley, you may or may not know, a mathematical economist who got fed up with the arguments in macro and went and talked to employers up in the northeast of the uh, United States and asked them during a recession what they actually did. The picture he got was very different from anything in the models. Herbert Simon, he has written a great deal. Well, Herbert Simon was a key member, one of the first five people who implemented the Marshall Plan, so he knew a great deal about actual detailed implementation of uh, what happened in the economy, and of course he went on to get the Nobel Prize and to make many, many contributions. My own somewhat small contribution is that I did study 52 asset managers, and it was quite clear to me from that book that the way people behave in financial markets has very little to do with much of the theory. What I got out of that was that what matters is social interaction, what uh, Soros calls fallibility. So because agents are interpreting the world, they obviously interpret the world wrong. And if a group of agents all interpret the world wrong for a long time, that can happen and everything will go according to those, quote, misinterpretations. But under radical uncertainty, you can't say they're misinterpretations because you don't know what the correct thing is to do. So in my view, none of the descriptions of decision-making in these studies are consistent with standard models, and nor is that the case for many, many other studies which I've mentioned in the, in the full version of this paper. So what we're looking for is a economic, macroeconomics, which has what one might call ecological validity and bounded rationality, to use Simon's term. But the problem here is that Simon's idea has been completely misinterpreted in a great deal of economics. His statement is this, from the Quarterly Journal of Economics, I think actually 1955, not 1946. The task is to replace the global rationality of economic man with a kind of rational behavior that is compatible with the access to information and the computational capacities that are actually possessed by organisms, including man, in the kind of environments in which such organisms exist. So this is not optimization under constraints. This is two sides to it. On the one hand, the possible limits of computational capacity, but on the other hand, the limits to knowing what the right answers or what it is to do based on the situation in which you actually find yourself in, which is, rational, uh, which is radical uncertainty. So from, in my view, the general assumption of global rationality 
And the assumption of risk rather than uncertainty throughout economics, in fact, has really avoided the proper study of how economic actors coordinate. And that's what the future needs to look at. Now, in the work that the team I have and I do at University College, we've developed something called conviction narrative theory, which comes out of the finance study that I mentioned. And the basic idea here, in fact, is remarkably similar in my, to the way I understand Keynes from my days at uh, his college. So actors supplement and support reasonable calculation, Keynes thought, with what he called animal spirits. And so to put aside thoughts of ultimate loss as a healthy man puts aside the expectation of death. If the animal spirits are dimmed and the spontaneous optimism falters, leaving us to depend on nothing but a mathematical expectation, enterprise will fade and die. Though fears of loss may have a basis no more reasonable than hopes of profit had before. So the key point is neither profit nor loss you can particularly know about. And this is basically what, came, what you could consider the problem of action. So you turn the problem around. Under uncertainty, it's not a question of selecting the correct action. It's a, it's a question of how do people know that it's safe or right to act at all. Now, in conviction narrative theory is a, so, is a new social psychological theory of decision making which asks exactly that question. How do economic actors manage to act in radical uncertainty and with what consequences for the way they coordinate when their decisions are aggregated? And what we say is that agents individually adopt conviction narratives, so that could be a firm, adopt one, narratives they think are accurate and feel are true, that are subjectively capable of supporting action because cognitively and effectively through their thinking and their feelings, they manage both the anticipations of potential gain and loss associated with its uncertain consequences. Now, the point about narratives, and it's a crucial point, is that they can respond much more rapidly than the fundamentals underlying it. And that's the kind of thing we've been seeing in the last few years in spades in a lot of different areas. The world hasn't changed really a huge amount, surprisingly, in, in the last 10 years, if you will look at actually the details of, of many actual lives. Of course, there have been all sorts of things. But the narratives about them change much more quickly and can simply flip like that. So the model of a conviction narrative theory, therefore, and it's very different, if I had time I'd explain it to you, than the model of psychology, for example, with uh, Daniel Kahneman and the standard behavioral economics, here, we have cognitive, deliberative processes and emotional processes interacting all the time. And the point here is that cognition is always embodied, is always in the body. The brain is constantly engaged in a relationship to the, our capacity for survival, reproduction, and so on. And so that any kind of narrative has to feel good before we adopt it. So this leads to a conviction narrative, and that then leads to action. So in this theory, you see this complicated graph here, which tries to bring together the different things that are influencing people when they take action. So for example, the fund managers I studied would have a high-level narrative, which sort of tells them what they're doing and what they're trying to do and in which they believe. This assists them with opportunity identification. So opportunities come along, such as fit according to particular narratives they have, and I'll talk about that later, perhaps if there's time. But these are particularly relevant or particularly sent to them in the particular local social environment in which they're operating. So if you're in a particular fund management house or in a particular part of the world, there'll be particular heuristics, rules, models, conventions that you draw on and which give you confidence that they're the things to do because that is the way things are done in that particular environment. And it's particularly important, the other aspect here, which is trusted sources. So which people, if you're, a, if you're in finance, which are the people who advise you? Which are the bits of information do you trust? There's a huge amount of psychology dealing with the fact that what people think they trust makes a huge amount of difference. So you can dress people up to look trustworthy, and they say exactly the same as people who don't look trustworthy. It's subjective. 
and you'll get a completely different result. Same with presentational components, that is the way things are presented. So all this adds up into generating two potential sets of feelings. And I can illustrate that if you're listening to me now. So as you're listening to me, you're thinking, or you are, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're kind of going, yeah, that makes sense. No, I don't like the sound of that. That sounds very dodgy. Do you get the idea? And so as you're listening to me or as you're appraising narratives, you are thinking yes or you're thinking no. You go forward or back. So what happens in a conviction narrative is the overall, in order to act in the particular way, obviously the approach emotion has to trump the, the uh, negative one. Now, the key point about all this is that I think if you give a lot of thought to it, this is probably the way most major decisions are made in, within an economy, but that's not where it's, uh, it ends. The point of this model is it then focuses you on, okay, so how do people get convinced? What is it that's going on that gets people convinced? And one of the aspects there is the narrative circulating in society or the state of things in the world. And because, of course, unlike in economics, in real life, people are looking around and, you know, what's he thinking? What's he thinking? What's he doing? There's a massive, in, in finance in particular, just massive amount of looking around to see what other people are doing. And so the, this is a theory of how individuals make decisions, but related to the, if you like, the ecology of narratives and so on that are around about how things are done. So I won't go into it, but we have something called divided state theory, which is a theory about the state of mind in which you can be when you're making decisions. And there are kind of two states of mind you can be in. One is the one that you would think we'd all love to be in, which is that when evidence comes along, we evaluate it uh, according to its value as evidence. The other, what's called a divided state, is we evaluate things purely on the basis of what we already feel. So if you look at this diagram here, supposing you already have some sort of narrative idea about what's happening, if you get new information and you're in a integrated state, that's the kind of state you'd all want to be in, then you will modify your narrative and modify what, you, what you're going to do. But if you're in a divided state, then if you get information which fits, makes you feel doesn't make you feel massively uncomfortable, you may pay attention to it, which will, of course, increase your tendency to do what you were previously going to do. This can help to explain bubbles. But if you get information that is, makes you feel uncomfortable, then there's a strong tendency for people not to pay attention. So this is the kind of thing I would say happened leading into the financial crisis. Now, we can actually do something with this. I'm going to take a couple of extra minutes. Okay. We can actually do something with this, uh, which we explained in some detail in the paper and in published work, by taking this intuition that emotions of, of, uh, of approach and avoidance, if you find them in narratives or in The Guardian or in all the thing, over time, that these are actually giving you information about if you like the state of confidence, or in Keynes' term, the state of uh, animal spirits in, in the economy. Now, if you look at this particular graph, what we've done there is we've taken all the Reuters news articles between 1996 and 2014, that's uh, several million. We've uh, used the computer, of course, to uh, extract from these articles all the articles that mention the word liquidity. We've then counted the presence of words that indicate approach and words that indicate avoidance. And we've drawn a nice time series, which you see there. And you see that mentions of the word liquidity, when it's going down, it means there's an increasing amount of avoidance or anxiety. When it's going up, an increasing amount of approach. So you see that leading into the financial crisis, the word liquidity is increasingly occurring in contexts where there's less and less avoidance, doubt, anxiety, those kinds of things. So this particular technique may be usable with complex topic ideas, because, of course, this is ex post, right? But there is a possibility of using that way things are going with computer methods to identify topics to be of some use in trying to see which kinds of things are going on in the economy. We also have a second method of doing it, which I won't elaborate because of time, 
but where we can look at the extent to which narratives are coming together in a consensus sense or they're more, more dispersed. And you can see from there that actually, again, leading up to the financial crisis, narratives were increasingly, uh, con uh, there was a consensus about narratives, so whereas afterwards there's been much more uncertainty and things are much more dispersed. We can also use this idea in a completely separate way, which is to say, well, movements in this, because that was to do with topics, right? Movements in, in the economy in terms of the amount of approach and avoidance emotions in the whole economy may give you some information about what is happening. So here is for the Canadian economy, that's for the UK economy, and that's for the US economy. And you can see there that you've got RSS, that's the relative sentiment shift, which is this approach avoidance. You've got GDP and you've got fixed investment. And I don't think I've got time to really go through it, but you can see, if you looked at it, that this goes up and down with the kinds of things you would expect it to be associated with. There's no causal implication with those things that are written there. But there is, uh, as you'll see from this, uh, you can actually see, if you look at our, how RSS has behaved, all those numbers that are in bold, right, show at least two standard deviation moves in that in, in a particular period from the norm. So uh, the mean value over the period 2003, quarter two, to 2007, quarter, quarter two. And you see there that for a whole bunch of countries, from 2007 Q2, you begin to get this very significant change in the RSS long before, long before people realized what was going on into the, into the economy. You probably remember that the credit market froze in August 2007, uh, that uh, the Lehman thing wasn't until, off the chart there, wasn't until uh, Q3, that most central banks were still forecasting that the economy was going to expand in Q3 2008. There is actually Granger causality between RSS and these measures of GDP in to some extent in these three economies. And for those of you who like vector autoregression models, there's also clear uh, effect of RSS on the uh, US production and employment, UK production and UK employment, and Canadian uh, production. And these effects are up to 18 to 20 months out. Thank you very much. Okay. Right, I'm going to open up to questions in a minute, just to make a couple of uh, two or three points. Um, one is that, um, from where I was sitting as a journalist, it, was, it seemed to me quite obvious that the model in 2008 was about to blow up, and that was not because I used any uh, economics uh, to do so, it was just because I used basic journalistic techniques, and two of the things we always learn is never trust anybody at any time about anything, so question everything very deeply, uh, always be deeply sceptical about it, and ask who is benefiting from uh, this particular paradigm. And it was quite clear that the financial markets were using this model to justify their increasingly reckless behaviour. The other point was that journalists, uh, from their own experience, know when people are winging it. Uh, and there was a real extent to which people were winging it back before the crisis, in my view. They'd constructed these beautiful models that didn't really seem to have uh, any great uh, grounding in reality. And journalists you know, find out what's going on by talking to people and walking, you know, we walk around, talk to people, uh, observe things. And the models that were there to justify what was going on uh, didn't seem to have any real bearing on what we were seeing with the benefit of our own eyes and, and, and just talking to people. And so you know, when readers said to me, this looks like a big bubble in the housing market, in the financial markets in 2006, it was hard to disagree, because uh, it obviously was. You, know, you just you need to use your, your own eyes uh, and a little bit of uh, economic history to actually uh, see that this was just a repeat of what had happened before. And I think um, David makes a good point, uh, David, David Vines made a good point about how these big shifts in economics tend to happen uh, when uh, there's a big shock to the system. Uh, in the 1930s, there was one. In the 1970s, there was one. I'm not really... Uh, you'd imagine that there'd be a really big fundamental shift in economics as a result of 2008. And I'm not quite sure... Uh, I'm not quite sure 
but why that hasn't happened. The status quo seems to have uh, clung on by its fingertips, uh, and I'm not sure there's been that much change, and certainly not in the way there was in the 1930s or in the 1970s. Um, and to me, you know, looking at it now, you, you imagine that the, the economists would have been run out of town like the old medicine shows were in the Wild West for peddling <laughs> fake remedies, um, but they haven't. I mean, they're, they're still quite well, uh, quite well dug in. Uh, and and I, I, I canvassed this with a couple of the panelists, and, and one argument was uh, that you know, it's, it's a question of incentives, that there's an incentive to actually uh, get in the top economic journals. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I must say, I'm not totally, still not totally convinced that, that, must, that that's the reason. I, I think we might want to explore uh, some, something on, along those lines. Just a couple of final points. Um, I mean, I, I loved um, John's description of the uh, uh, Neo Keynesian dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model that you know, it's not new, it's not Keynesian, it's not uh, dynamic enough, it's not stochastic enough, it's not general equilibrium enough. Apart from that, absolutely fine. Uh, um, and I, I just wonder whether, even with um, uh, David Vines' uh, five refinements, we, we, we can ever, you know, we, we, whether that's going to actually uh, sort things out. And I think that my final point is this, that uh, in economics, I think there's always a tendency to think we know more than we actually do um, and uh, pretend a level of expertise that maybe we just don't have. And I think that, in, in a sense, central banks uh, are, are part of the problem because we've handed over uh, an awful lot of power to central banks as these uh, supposed technocratic experts. And it wouldn't be very good for these central banks to come along and be asked, well, what's going to happen to the economy? And, be, and the honest answer is, well, we don't really know. Um, but they don't actually, to, to, to a large extent. The, the future is uh, incredibly uncertain. Um, but you know, we, ha we have vested them with this enormous power, uh, and we've just got to keep our fingers crossed and hope that they have learned some lessons uh, from the crisis. Otherwise, we could be in for uh, something quite bumpy. So uh, that's really my uh, four penneth. Um, are there any questions specifically for John? Because he has got to shoot. Well, I'll take some questions for the panel generally, but um, if you can come forward and, and come to the mic. Yeah, there's a question there. Yeah, and can you ca come forward as well, and then you'll... We'll, we'll um, uh, Richard Hatfield, uh, University of Bath. Uh, I've just got uh, one for uh, David at, at this point. Uh, in John Maynard Keynes by Minsky, he actually uh, well, criticises the Hicks, uh, Hansen, uh, general equilibrium, L ISLM, as a bastardization of um, basically Keynes' disequilibrium model, and that uh, that's uh, and that uh, that whole process. In fact, he's quite critical of the, the the whole of that general equilibrium concept being applied to Keynes in, himself, and then goes on to develop his own theories within that. Have you any? Com uh, that would be one point. And the other the other one is more about uh, understanding. Um, that in fact, I think that most macroeconomists don't actually understand banks. And that they don't understand banks, because I've spent many years working in it, I'm actually late into the macroeconomics, so it's a, uh, is that um, uh, they actually don't understand the accounting practices of banks and the things of what, uh, that they're managing their liquidity and how that works within banks, and they're managing their credit risk and how that affects it and how they have to write things off and so on. So, and that falls very much into uh, David's uh, view, is that they have to forecast all of this, and they, ha uh, and they have this sentiment of, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? And, they, uh, and how they reinforce each other with that. And I think that um, uh, there's a, uh, one thing I, I, I have not observed in any variation of a model is actually the modeling of the balance sheet, the statement of cash, fl uh, statement of cash flows, all the, um, uh, the profit and loss statements within the banking structure of a, uh, of a macroeconomic model. Because it exists, it's there, that's what they manage on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, they manage it by the hour. So it's, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's my two penny worth, as you might say. Okay. So John, do you want to take the point about banks? Or yeah, just um, a quick one. The, um, in this work we did on France, um, we used the, the NPL ratio of, of the French banking system 
as a major ingredient in, in, in the credit conditions index. So, so it turned out that from, from 1990 onwards, um, what happens to the non-performing non loans in French banks is very closely related to their ability to advance credit. Yes, yes. So it, it actually gives you a linkage between what's happening in the banking system and what's happening to the household sector, yeah. which is part of understanding what's going on, yeah. not the full story. Yeah, it's it, yeah. Well, the, well, banks are quite heavily constrained by their credit risk profile, let's say, yeah. um, and, how they, and how they balance that credit risk against their liquidity, let's say, so, and the way they have to write things up as well as well as not doing that. David, do you want to take the first point? Well, Which bit of Keynes is the right one? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was reminded as you asked that, that question of our discussion about Adam Smith on the first day. There are, uh, are at least two Adam Smiths and neoclassical economics has had a field day with the wealth of nations whilst ignoring so many of the other insights. I think it's right to say that there are many John Maynard Keynes, that the ISLM uh, clarification of the central idea and the general theory uh, was fundamentally important. We, um, uh, without that, it, there wouldn't have been a way to teach economics clearly that inspired in a valuable way that generation of people between the end of the Second War and, and the 1970s, which made an extraordinary difference. But that wasn't all of what's in Keynes. I agree with you about the importance of his study of finance and Minsky's ideas. But I would just add sideways that I've written a book on Keynes arguing that he was fundamentally concerned with globalization and the international world, which is yet, an, having grown up as he did in the empire, having a father and friends that managed the world, writing about how to manage the world led to his work on Bretton Woods, uh, completely ignored in much of contemporary macroeconomics, but fundamental to an understanding. So there we are, we've got at least three important John Maynard Keynes in play. Okay, thank you. Is there a question here? Hi, uh, I'm Hannah, I work at Rethinking Economics. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the panel, uh, both about your candidness about mistakes of the past, but it's also great to see solid work being done on creating alternatives to rational economic man. Um, I wondered if I could just garner some of your expert opinions on a couple of futuristic macroeconomic policies. Um, and if you don't like any of the ones I suggest, please share your own. Um, the first one is the establishment of the maximum internal wage ratio. The second one would be the nationalization of broadband and internet access. And the third one would be a three-day weekend. Okay, right. <laughs> John, I'm going to ask you to... I know you've, you've, you've pushed for time, so any of those... Um, any of those float your boat or well, not float your the, boat? the... Um, Internal wage ratio, I have a lot of, a lot of sympathy for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the CEO reward model is, is very seriously broken. Um, there's, no real, there's no real evidence that the sort of, you know, yeah. great bifurcation of, of the top to bottom owners has actually led to any great improvement in anything, is there? It hasn't led to higher investment, hasn't led to higher products. It, was, it just led to higher wages for people at the top. Um, yeah, the, the three-day uh, three weekend... That's a tough one. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the labor market is, um, is a bit of a conundrum. And, and obviously, with, with um, what may be happening to artificial intelligence and, and, and robots, we might have to seriously address this issue. But of course, um, there are many people for whom work is actually um, a hobby. <laughs> and and um, imposing a three-day weekend on them wouldn't actually stop them from carrying on. Does, hang on, I want to, I think Dave wants to, I'll, I'll bring it in a second. I, know, I think part of the problem, I mean, this kind of issue has been raised quite a bit in the conference, this type of problem. So it seems to me that, the, that what we should be trying to think about is how could we get an answer to that question or a set of answers to that question based on a set of assumptions that we can make very transparent which would allow sensible discussion on the issue, because there's been a lot said in the conference which could allow you to think that, and I suppose the contribution I would make to it is 
would be to say that I really do think that narratives really matter and that economists are a bit obsessed too quickly with the idea, you know, you know what the real world is and a narrative's just a narrative. Actually, to a very significant extent, narratives make the world and can go on making it for a very long time. Now, that, that doesn't mean you can just do what you want. But, I mean, the, the most impressive narr narrative was the uh, um, I'll do what it takes of the ECB, which, as far as I can see, was just a few words that people believed. It's very unclear whether he could have carried it out, whether it was really constitutional or not. But it, 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 and then once you'd got over, once that narrative had been accepted, it then changed things. So I would look at the kind of questions so what, you're raising what, what, in what, that what, way. What narrative would, you, would there be around a three-day weekend then, or the nationalisation of broadband? Well, the nationalisation, I mean, you'd, you'd have to, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that there presumably would be arguments for and against, mm. but you could, you, could, you could, in the end, you'll win that argument by whether or not the narrative catches on. So a lot of the policy issues we're discussing is really about trying to understand, well, what would be the objections people, you know, it will come up to that, you know, not just the objections that people are not going to get their profits, but what would be the objection, and then how would that be, be worked David. through? Can I take that narrative story further on the three-day week? Uh, that uh, we were reminded uh, that Keynes, who keeps on appearing here, there, and everywhere, uh, said in the economic consequences for our grandchildren that he imagined by about 2017 we'd all be working a 15-day week, a 15-hour week, and enjoying ourselves in in the other many hours of the week, and and I think one of the real reasons we're not doing that is what Adair Turner and others have talked about, our desire for positional goods and the consumption that that leads us to undertaking in order to be better off than the people around us. And that's essentially a narrative story. And you say, if people are busy doing that, then it makes them very, it very hard for them to find a way of of supporting enough resources to keep the National Health Service running and to, and to run the schools and to do other things. And it, it, we would be wanting to work less hard if so, only if we persuaded ourselves that we already had enough roads, schools and things that we need, as well as enough positional consumption to feel better than everybody else. But see, I would say that's a, that's a hypothesis. But what we need to be doing is actually establishing it. I think there's quite a lot of ways of arguing that actually people aren't only in a race to, for positional goods and that there are different ways of motivating and so on and so forth. I mean, I think we don't know because once you're within a social system that's operating in a certain way, it operates in that way, but it can change. Uh, uh, there is one piece of evidence, which is the performance of the French economy where limits on, on the working week, uh, I think, proved pretty unsuccessful in stimulating employment. Anna, what, what do you think? I, okay. um, well, I only work four days a week, and uh, <laughs> I'm pretty happy. Um, it allows me to study in my free time. It allows me to socialize. Um, a lot of my friends are pursuing more flexible working because it has a good impact on our mental health. I think all of these are indicators that a future macroeconomic macroeconomist needs to be taking into account. Um, but thank you for your comments and consideration. Yeah. No, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that, I mean, Keynes actually said in the, in the, in the economic consequence of her grandchildren was that the productivity would go up about eight-fold between the 1930s and that, which it has done. I mean, you know, the, he was right about that, wasn't he? It's just, it's just that we haven't actually decided... To use to, it in uh, this way. To use it in the way well, that... But uh, in, in some senses, there's an argument on your side that we're choosing to use our greater wealth in, in not satisfying ways. Well, I mean, although different countries do do actually apportion improvements in productivity and growth in different ways, don't they? So, you know, if you go to the States, you know, when the economy grows, they, they tend to work longer hours rather than take more leisure time. The Europeans take more leisure time. Yeah. So it is a choice. I think that's absolutely right. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Rob Smith, and I'm in Denmark at the moment. I'm fortunate enough to be in quite a heterodox economics department, so I have a slightly controversial question, and that would be that we've talked now about how some of these macroeconomic models, they failed to predict the crisis, but there were some guys that had pretty good models 
that took into account some of the th things that Steve Keen mentioned yesterday about macroeconomic balances or, or rather imbalances that have feedback effects into the economy. And a gentleman by the name of Dirk Betzema wrote quite a good summary article of several of the guys who did a good job of predicting the problems that we have now. Some of the contextual problems that led up to it, but also the stagnation problems that would follow. And I haven't heard any of the names mentioned now that we're looking at the future of macroeconomics. Uh, some of the contemporary ones that I've had the fortune of reading are Wynne Godley, Robert Blecker, Randall Ray, and some people, or one lady who's here now has talked far more about the methodological aspects of macroeconomics, that's Sheila Dow, and one of her colleagues, Victoria Schick. And I, I don't hear any of that being integrated into what's going to follow from a modeling point of view. So th there is a textbook out by Mark Lavoie and Wynne Guidley, the late Wynne Guidley, who have incorporated fundamental uncertainty into a long-term modeling program, or, or paradigm, you might call it. But I haven't heard any of that. I'm, I was wondering, why is that? Why haven't we heard about these people who have been working on it? I mean, Wynne Godley started in the 1970s on it, yeah. under Nicholas Kohler, who was in the bank, so. Yeah, yeah. Just a bit curious. David, why, 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 I mean, there were, you're right, there were people in, in advance of the crisis who actually said there's something, there's, there's something, I think Steve Keane was one of them who, who, who spotted it coming. Uh, you know, Nuru Rabini was another one. So, I mean, there were, there were a few people. I mean. It, Take, take that point on, David. That's an interesting uh, point, I think. I wrote my first article uh, working with Wyn Godley way back then, uh, and I think that that stuff was driven out of macroeconomics by the Euler equation that John ridiculed. But the balance sheet work that John talks about, it, the empirical, careful, thorough balance sheet work, is essentially a taking forward of that set of ideas that... that Godly and, and others have had. And so I, th I, uh, uh, I wasn't able to talk about everything in, in, in exactly 20 point naught minutes. And one of the things that I would have talked about is the way in which a study of finance is leading us to want to understand that radical rise in risk premium which happened during the, the uh, crisis in 2008. And uh, the person to ridicule as an inappropriate model uh, in not being able to deal with that isn't, isn't just what I put on the blackboard, but the very famous textbook by Woodford, which has no financial system and no banks and no nothing in it of that kind. And, and uh, I think the last 10 years have made a serious push in directions mm -hmm. model. M many people are now working on models with financial systems in, in which there can be shocks that radically propagate through rising risk premia and bankruptcy and leverage cascades that cause the economy to collapse. We couldn't have done that 15 years ago. I, I think... David, uh, David, do you want to... Uh, David? I mean, I, I, think, I think it's a good question, actually, but, but, so I, but I think it, it, it's a question of, which is kind of two ways you have to think about it. One is the whole, the whole question of how do ideas get taken up of, you know, not just in economics, but in, in other places. And really, you know, the, the relationship between ideas in science and whether they're taken up in, in policy is already a big issue, even, yeah. even without going into sort of controversial ideas like in economics. Um, and then the second problem is in economics itself, I think a problem of evidence. So, so the fact that, that economics has not grown up as a discipline which made trying to test ideas against each other as its main way of proceeding, which we know is difficult, but it's, for example, you know, the, the, you'll all have seen the film The Big Short, and, you know, the guy in The Big Short goes out and has a look at the housing and sees all these for sale signs in all the uh, thing, and this kind of thing is not so impossible. And I think to understand the narratives that are going on, to understand what's going on, we, we, need, to, we need to consider not junking what we've got now, but adding to it uh, you know, much more empirical ways of looking at things and testing whether theories are what I call 
group think theories, divided state theories, or whether you know, they actually work. And clearly some of these models, which my two colleagues on the, <laughs> some of the, you know, they just don't contain stuff that is, is realistic. So. Very quickly, because our time's up. So, uh, just to say that on your side in that discussion with David, I think we, macroeconomics has been a discipline in which algebraic coherence has triumphed over appealing to facts. It's what you teach your graduates to do now, did until the crisis. And I think uh, that way of, do, as, as many of my colleagues have said, 15 years ago, uh, young students and their, uh, and their mid-career colleagues spent their time understanding the way the economy works. Uh, until the crisis, people spent their time understanding the way theory could help them tell a, 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 a precise piece of argument about the economy. I think the effect of that failure in the crisis has forced people to be much more serious in the way you, you would want. And that's, that's a very, very good thing in my view. So uh, on, that, on that hopeful note, um, I'm going to call this session to a hand. Uh, um, John's gone, but I'm sure you'd like to join me uh, in thanking the two remaining panellists, uh, David Vines and David Tuckett. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a good session. Thank you.